I would like to welcome uh, everyone to this new event of the IPI intellectual series. The Syrian people are heroically struggling to reclaim the rule of law and their right to freedom, dignity, and economic development. Other Arab countries, other Arab spring countries, uh, imploded. There is fear that Syria might explode. The implications for the region, giving serious political, social, and geographical importance, are difficult to gauge now, but will be without a doubt far-reaching. In prior events, as you recall, we have hosted writers from Libya, Yemen, Egypt, and Tunisia. Today, the IPI is pleased to have Samar Yazbek, a prominent Syrian writer, filmmaker, and a journalist, and a TV producer, to be our keynote speaker. Samar hails from an important family. She is a Syrian above all other affiliations. The Assad asks for blind obedience of the Alawites. But Samar and many other Alawites, like her, refused to be complacent in a policy of violent suppression. She argues in her beautiful book, Woman in the Crossfire, which is being sold outside uh, this room, that, and I quote, thinking about how the regime has turned the Alawites into its human shields, sends me into a bottomless pit of sorrow." End quote. <laughs> so, uh, Summer reminds us that the leader who refused the establishment of the attack des, des Alawite by demanding that France safeguard the unity of Syria was Aziz Bek Hawash, a proud Alawite Syrian. Summer grandfather, from her mother's side, fought in the resistance against the Ottomans' presence in Syria. Her grandfather, Ibrahim Saleh Yazbek, gave his possession and land to the peasants way before any land reform was enacted. Some in the West are under the mistaken belief that the current Syrian regime commands the loyalty of the Alawite sect. Summer disagrees, and she puts it beautifully, and I quote, fear of ancient humiliation long endured by the Alawites Fear of homelessness and oppression brought, brought them closer to the regime, to the regime's narrative, forcing, forcing them behind it with all they possessed." End quote. The question that must be asked then is, is the Syrian opposition managing effectively to counter the regime narrative. The Alawites and other minorities who remain neutral, or to a degree some of them sympathize with the regime, 
without the fear of chaos must be assured that they will indeed be an equal partner in a new Syria. Summer argues that the essence of the Syrian uprising is moral first and foremost. It is hard to dispute that, but it is equally hard for the Syrian opposition to succeed without allaying the fears of those who remain convinced by the regime narrative that the alternative is indeed calamitous. There is a pervading fear among minorities in Syria that an Iraq-like quagmire will transpire after the demise of the current Assad regime. To succeed, the Syrian opposition must appreciate and allay the fear of those who remain convinced that the alternative to the Assad regime is chaos. Our luminous speaker, that is to say, Samar, will address these concerns among other issues. But we are uh, fortunate to have with us today Dr. We Max Weiss, Assistant Professor of History and Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. He is the author of In the Shadow of Secretarianism, Law, Shiism, and the Making of Modern Lebanon. Professor Weiss superbly, and I told him so, translated Samar Yezbek, important book about the Syrian uh, uh, uprising, the crossfire of women in the crossfire, diaries of the Syrian revolution. And I would like first to invite, before we invite our distinguished guest, I would invite uh, Professor Weiss first to uh, uh, make few remarks before we start. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you all for coming. I, I would like to say that I'm very grateful to the International Peace Institute for this kind invitation. I recognize that I am here at the pleasure of the Ambassador and the uh, members of the Institute, so I'm grateful for this chance and already grateful for all the, all the assistance that they've given to me, but most importantly to Samar. I'm not going to uh, drag on for very long because uh, while we could in a different setting talk about why the translator should not be silent, I think uh, in this case uh, we are all here to allow Samar Yezbek to speak. So I would just say a few words by way of introduction and since I have the opportunity to do so, I will take some liberties. First of all, uh, I had not met Samar Yezbek until the fall of 2011, although I was a secret admirer of her writing for many years before that. So one of the remarkable coincidences that went into the making of this book, at least in its English translation, is the fact that, uh, as Samar is aware, towards the tail end of the period that is chronicled in this, uh, it's now been called harrowing so many times I feel bad using the word, this harrowing account, we actually were both inside Syria in June and July of 2011, but we didn't know each other, and for all we know, we either uh, overtly or covertly passed each other in some way, shape, or form. The, uh, the other coincidence that, that, that brought me to work on this book in the first place was uh, a connection that was made by Samar's friend and French language translator in Paris, Rania Samara. And so uh, there is an Arabic expression, so the notion that uh, coincidence is better than an appointment rings true very much for me uh, in, in this particular case, but in general. So that being said, I think you'll all find 
if you have read the book and if you haven't, when you read the book, that Samar Yazbek is a tremendously brave and courageous woman who consistently has spoken her mind in a way that is fearless and iconoclastic. And for that, she is to be commended. Even more than that, she is to be commended for not falling into the many traps that are laid out for her and for others involved in the Syrian opposition. And the most important trap I'm speaking about has already been referenced today, which is the trap of sectarianism. And so Samar would actually prefer that I not go down the line I'm about to go down and to not talk at all about the matter of sectarianism. But I think it's worth emphasizing that as the ambassador said in his introduction, Samar Yazbek is a Syrian writer. And Samar Yazbek is a Syrian patriot. Samar Yazbek comes from a very uh, famous and uh, at certain points in its history, well-off family from the coastal region of the Northwest. That being said, Samar is not willing to allow for her birthright, if you like, to be hijacked by those who would choose fear over compassion and empathy. And so the last point I would like to make as a, as a nod to Samar's bravery and the bold steps that she's already taken up until this point and will continue to take, as she will say time and again, until the regime falls, I would like her, Samar, and her colleagues and comrades to take note of the fact that the diversity of Syria, its religious diversity, its ethnic diversity, its ideological diversity is one of the most powerful assets in their national arsenal. So if there can be a way to find hyphenating capabilities such that it won't be a shock for someone to introduce herself as a Kurdish Syrian or as an Adelie Syrian, if that is actually a source of pride and of common ground, then this revolution will have succeeded, and I think Summer is going to show us some ways to get there. So thank you again for the invitation. How oh, Summer? Good afternoon. I would like to uh, thank you, Your Excellency, and thank you, Max, for this uh, warm introduction. I'd like to uh, begin my uh, comments. I will not speak for long because I would like to uh, leave more room for debate and interaction between us, and I would like to uh, send a great salute from here, where we are, to the heroes of Syria and its martyrs. I apologize. I would like to salute all factions of the uh, Syrian people who are standing bravely and courageously in the face of uh, al-Assad's dictatorship. I would also like to summarize some aspects of my experience and the experience uh, of my friends and those that have been in Syria because I believe that there's a lot of ambiguity and a lot of uh, facts that are being sidelined and hidden and are presented to you in an incomplete way. I'm, I won't say that they are misrepresented, but they are incomplete. And sometimes half the truth in cases like the Syrian revolution could mean a misrepresentation of the facts. When the Arab revolutions started in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, we would set out in demonstrations to the uh, Libyan and uh, Egyptian and Tunisian embassies. We would be a group of Syrian youth who stand by these re revolutions. And that's when we seriously and genuinely started considering, through groups of Syrian youth, 
we started considering a larger question. Will there be a revolution in Syria to match the revolution that took place in Egypt and the one that took place in Libya and in Tunisia? This question was more of, of, of a form of doubt because we were very frightened because we were all very aware of the true dictatorship and the true nature of the al-Assad regime and its complex way of ruling the country where Bashar al-Assad was the illegitimate heir to the country and the country's leadership from his father, Hafez al-Assad. We would organize some demonstrations at the beginning of February so that we would be in the heart of Damascus. And I would, and I say to you that these demonstrations, frankly, were a failure. Not many showed up. There was a lot of fear. And in the meantime, the Dara'a events began on the 15th of uh, March, 2011. The Dara'a events happened, and the public revolt or intifada set out. And popular revolutionaries began to go out, and we would look at this stand we would try to plan so that we would keep up with this popular revolution. And you all know the real reason for this. I don't know if you are all aware of the actual facts that led to, or the actual fact that led to the explosion of the situation in Syria, which is where children were tortured and they had their nails pulled out and women were being molested and were being tortured and humiliated by al-Assad's henchmen in uh, Dara. And that's what, led, that's what led to the snowballing of the events. And in the first few months, no Syrian presented the idea or proposed the idea of overthrowing the regime. I'm not saying this because I'm a Syrian, but I could tell you this because we were traveling in the meantime, during that time, between the different cities and villages. These were good people who just wanted some reforms. All they wanted was, for example, the cancellation of the martial law, of the emergency law. They wanted some economic demands because of the poverty that they were living in. The revolution set out in, from the most impoverished areas in the, the Damascus uh, suburbs and the rural areas and elsewhere. And people were just making these simple demands. At the beginning of the revolution, we would go out on Fridays and I would go to the demonstrations and I saw firsthand things that for a long time I could not believe happened in Syria. A group of people carrying civilian signs that are non-sectarian, carrying flowers, carrying olive branches, and demanding a democratic state. And the response, the direct response to these demands was killing. Snipers would target the young men in the demonstrations. One of the young men actually fell right in front of me, and he was standing next to me. He was hit by a sniper directly by a security guard. They are killed. They were beaten uh, barbarically. They were uh, enforced their disappearances. Their houses were raided. These were barbaric responses to civilian and peaceful demonstrations that were non-sectarian. They were genuinely non-sectarian, were oppressed and were suppressed barbarically and brutally. And as a result of this, 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 this brutal response, the demonstration spread because people were killed who were relatives of others or friends of others. And in Syria, a form of social cohesion between ordinary citizens emerged. And I repeat, ordinary citizens, not even the elites. Ordinary people started feeling social cohesion, cooperation, and determination to keep this revolution going. However, Every time a demonstration, a peaceful demonstration would set out, it would be met with extreme violence, with murder, with the destruction of homes, with the burning down of homes, uh, with the attacks, uh, especially sexual attacks. There was a brutal way of dealing with the demonstrations and the regime uh, uh, on the in the person of uh, its official uh, spokesperson, Buthayna Shaban, would start making claims that this is a sectarian conflict and this is complete nonsense. Because when we would go out on demonstrations, we would be accompanied by Christians. And I, as Max said, uh, come from a, uh, a family that is originally Alawite. There would be Kurds, uh, Sunnis. All sects would be represented in these uh, demonstrations. There was a middle class that would walk shoulder to shoulder with the poor class.
classes. There was no single religious sect that 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 would emerge in these demonstrations. This was the case for the first four months. However, the regime then started a vicious campaign. And I would like to speak to you of my experience uh, in the coastline and where the, the city was uh, divided according to sects. And there were the sects, the Sunni neighborhoods were divided uh, away from the Alawite uh, neighborhoods so that Alawites were killed in Sunni neighborhoods and Sunnis were killed in Alawite neighborhoods to give the impression that there are Salaf, Islamic Salafis who want to exterminate the Alawites and exterminate the Christians. And this is not true. In fact, the Mukhabarat or the intelligence and the Shabiha, the, the, the thugs, were the ones who were doing all this. But the ordinary civilians, ordinary citizens, as well as the religious leaders of the Sunnah and the Alawites would try to accomplish reconciliation between the different communities. Reconciliation would be achieved. But then the what I would say that the hordes of the thugs, the Shabiha, because they acted like animals would come and wreak havoc again and more differences would emerge. And as for minorities, I object to the concept of minorities. Unfortunately, it's, it's, a, it's a political and historic concept, so I'm, I'm forced to use that expression. But whoever supported the revolution was imprisoned or killed or terrorized or had their reputation defamed or was pursued or their family was uh, persecuted in order to force them away from the streets. And frankly, they, they succeeded to a certain degree. And I just say to a certain degree, they didn't succeed much in tra turning these people into secret and clandestine activists in the revolution. And then other practices began. I will not, I don't want to go into, into much detail. I don't want to speak for too long. But I would like to say at the outset that this is how things started. As for weapons, they said that there are armed groups. And they, they said this from day one from the very first day of the peaceful demonstration. And I saw them carrying the olive branches and how they were killed while they were unarmed. There were no arms in Syria. There were no armed gangs except Bashar al-Assad's armed gang. There was no violent form that these demonstrations took. These demonstrations were peaceful and calling for peace. The young men of the revolution and the people of the revolution had been insisting on its peaceful nature. However, what happened was that the Syrian regime brought the army in and it demanded and it commanded army members to kill people. I'll give you some examples. Some people would be face to face with their relatives. They can't shoot their relatives. They can't shoot people, so they had to flee. And the reason they would flee, and when they flee, they would take their guns with them and their, their weapons with them. And that's where groups that were armed started forming. And they later called themselves the Free Syria Army. I don't really think that there is a Free Syria Army or the leadership of the Free Syria Army. No, these are armed militias that want to group themselves into an armed popular resistance. I just came back from Syria three weeks ago. I managed to go. I, I managed to go back into Syria, and I saw these uh, these forces and and uh, these battalions and how they were. They are no more than an armed popular resistance that are called brigades. Every village and every town formed its own form of resistance. What happened later, and this is the last point I will make because I don't really want to speak for too long. The crisis has been going on for a long time. The regime has been getting more brutal. The kinds of crimes that have been committed, and this is based on my knowledge of contemporary history, I don't think that it is matched in contemporary history. Cities were shelled by airplanes. Homs was the capital of the revolution. They feared Homs because the revolution was, uh, uh, was, was, was going in full strength there. And the rich and the poor and the middle class were all unified and amalgamated and, and, and allied together in the revolution. And therefore, the regime wanted to abort uh, the um, revolution in Homs. And this is why they bombed it with airplanes and they raided the neighborhoods, and they put 
a new sectarian map in Homs. An example, in terms of rapes, the largest percentage of rapes committed by the Shabiha in Syria was in Homs. And it was done on sectarian bases in the in the mixed uh, sect areas. The Alawite Shabiha would be asked to rape uh, women and would accuse the other other side of committing this rape. And they are even committed more barbaric uh, crimes. For example, the regime was committing a massacre every two or three weeks. And these massacres were committed in areas where there were already sectarian tensions, so that these tensions would deepen and and evolve into sectarian wars. So far, a Sunni village has never attacked an Alawite village, killing its residents as the regime wants to happen. Yes, there are violent, uh, there have been incidents of violence in the revolution because violence begets violence and violence begets its own monopolies and its own kind of economy. Weapons also beget a, an arms trade as well as warlords, etc. But all these actions were isolated actions that did not become a sectarian um, situation or a sectarian trend, despite the presence of tensions. And they started with homes, but then they started attacking city after city after city. And then the massacres are no longer done at a, on a weekly basis, rather they're done on a daily basis. Recently, for the past uh, few months, we witnessed tens of massacres a day on a daily basis in Syria. At least 200 people are killed in Syria a day. And these are the ones that we know about. These are the ones that we can document. But I believe that, on the other side, the soldiers who are falling are also Syrians, and the regime has their blood on its hands. Therefore, I don't think that no less than 350 martyrs fall in Syria every day. It is a nonstop massacre, and unfortunately, and because of the, 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 the inflammation of sectarian tensions, some acts of violence have taken place, as I've said. But they really are isolated. I fear now that the regime, I always say this, I fear that the regime would now fabricate a massacre in an Alawite village in order to detonate the entire situation in a final manner. One last point is that of the jihadists and the Salafis and Al-Qaeda, which the regime is using as a specter to scare the West. And it's a, it's, it's a very complicated issue and, and requires a very long time to discuss. No one can deny that in the Arab world, there is a rise in Islamic movements. In Syria, moderate Islam which has a armed battalions that I've seen recently, no more than three weeks ago, all of these battalions, these moderate Islamic battalions, want a civil state. Not all of them, of course. I will, I will talk to you about a certain sect that I certainly, I'm personally worried about. Islam, to these battalions, is a culture. It's a culture of life. It's about traditions and a way of life. It does not exceed the boundaries of the historic and cultural nature of the peoples of this region. However, and I believe that there is an attempt to push some jihadi elements into Syria recently with the purpose of breaking down this revolution. In some of the villages I've visited recently, I saw in one of those villages there were 750 fighters of which 19 were jihadists. However, these jihadists are completely disconnected from the reality of life in Syria. They came as a result of the militarization, the sectarian militarization that the, that the regime has committed, and they are a very small minority, too small to form any, any danger or, not, or even an outpost for the rise of a Salafi state or an Islamic caliphate as is being talked about in the West. Not even Al-Qaeda is there. Al-Qaeda is there, but it's, it, it is, Al-Qaeda itself is a foreign presence into Syrian life. They are actually Arab. 
they're from Tunisia, from Libya, but they are very few in numbers and they are not very welcome. They managed to uh, infiltrate Syria to defend the Sunnis because the regime gave the impression that this is an Alawite regime killing the Sunnis. This is not true because tens of Alawite officers have been liquidated because they supported the revolution and there were many officers that have fled the army and who testified to this. But at the end of the day, what appears clear and true is that the Alawite majority does support the regime because the regime has been a dictatorship for the past half a century and has been based on familial and religious and tribal affiliations instead of affiliations or instead of a feeling of affiliation to a state or to, a, to the law or to institutions. So all these Syrians, whether they're Alawite, Sunnis, or Christians, feel that they need to resort to their religious affiliations in order to protect themselves. Therefore, I say that despite all the problems that are happening in Syria now, and despite the blood flowing in the streets and the international, immoral international silence, this, this international silence by all countries and all governments in the world, it's immoral, the silence in the face of all the massacres that are being committed in Syria. The only solution here for us as Syrians and the entire world is to make sure that there are no hotspots of Islamic extremism and fundamentalism so that Syria and Syria will not be a chaotic state. Syria should be a civil state with a history and a culture. It is a country that has religious and sectarian and national and geographic diversity. The first step to put an end to all these fears should come in the overthrowing of the Al-Ajad regime. There is no other solution. Even through the diplomatic efforts by Akhtar Ibrahimi and Kofi Annan, I don't, I believe that the regime will not respond to all these attempts. These are only attempts to buy time. The governments in the world want to feel that uh, their conscience is clear before, its peop before their peoples and that they're doing their best. But what they're really doing is giving Bashar al-Assad's regime more time to kill the people of Syria and to fragment a country which is a historic country, a country that has one of the most important civilizations in the world. I apologize for uh, speaking fast, but uh, I would like to give you room to ask uh, questions because we could speak for uh, a very long time and we could delve into complex topics and uh, we could get emotional. I thank you. Thank you, um, Samar, for a moving talk on what is taking place in Syria. It is moving because Samar was part of the uprising. She was not a witness or a journalist. She was part of the uprising. That is why I think uh, we have to take whatever she says uh, very seriously. Um, it's now uh, the floor is open for whoever wants to to ask a question or to make an observation. And I first I give the floor to uh, Dr. Weiss. Thanks. <clears throat> it's the last time I'll exploit my position up here. Um, maybe not. The, uh, I'll ask the question in English, and then if Samar prefers, I'll ask it in Arabic uh, after. Um, I couldn't help but think, both while reading the diaries, uh, but also while you were just speaking, that there might be some exaggeration when you say things like the greatest moral crime in modern history. So I want you to elaborate a little bit on that, specifically by comparing to Hama in 1982, because people that you spoke with in Hama, you referenced Homs just now, but you could speak maybe about Homs in 2011 as compared to Hama in 1982 in terms of the people you spoke with, how they remember Hama and everything that was happening then, and how they perceive what's happening now with respect to that. If you don't need, I won't re-ask the question in Arabic, but I can. 
It's okay. Uh, uh, أنا أقول. Uh, I believe, or I say that the biggest moral crime is. I, I say that not to. Uh, not to uh, let off Hafez al-Assad's uh, regime from, from that crime, because a week ago, the uh, Hafez al-Assad's regime, says the speaker, killed 30,000 uh, Syrians in Hama in one week under the pretext of eliminating the Muslim Brotherhood movement. However, I believe that the world, even if it was aware of the reality of the situation, the nature of the media was different at the time. I don't deny the, I do not remove the, the aspect of immorality. Rather, I demand that the world, because the world is now watching. We have a massacre that's going on live on the air in front of the entire world that is sitting and watching it. And Hama, the massacre took place and it was buried. So it's a crime. And it, I'm, I'm saying immoral silence because the world is watching firsthand what is happening live. That's why it's immoral. But in 1982, in Hama, the massacre happened, and there was this international conspiracy uh, to hide it. And this conspiracy was worldwide, but we never actually saw the facts directly. We never knew the truth directly. But, but the media and everybody, including myself, when we go and I talk about this, all of us are watching it. Syrian blood is now a spectacle. This is why I say their silence is immoral over a massacre that did not happen over a day or two or a week. It has been happening for the past 19 months almost. Which is why I say that the, the, the changes in, in media throughout the world and the ease of access to what is happening in Syria now is what makes it truly horrific for the world to just stand there and watch as a spectator. The floor is open. Uh, Warren, please. Uh, Warren Hogue, uh, IPI. We are honored and pleased that you are here. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask you about your comment about the outside world and its silence. How would you, I think there are many people in the outside world that would like to put an end to the massacres. How can they do that? And the usual reasoning that people who would like to put an end to it give for not acting is that they don't know how to identify with people uh, on the ground in Syria. In other words, is there anything remotely like an organized rebel force that they could support? I guess my real question is, um, uh, is there a way that the outside world working with um, sympathetic people within Syria could take action to put an end to these massacres? I thank you for uh, this uh, question, which uh, opens a lot of uh, doors to existing complications. I think that there are many true and genuine intentions by several uh, people to help the uh, Syrian people, and I do not doubt that. Uh, and this, of course, exists among the peoples of the world. I believe that there is uh, a very strong international uh, sympathy and with the Syrian people. But as politics are, then politics are, are, are pragmatic, whereas morals always take a second seat uh, to uh, interests or backseat to interests. There is a rush to make pledges to the Syrian people to stand by their sides, but there is n not a slowness, rather a complete standstill in actually helping the Syrian people. The Russians, they, they said that the Russians are the reason or the Iranian situation, but I think it's more complicated than that. There is a game of interests being played by all of these states, the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians. There is a whole group of interests and international agreements over what is ha or understandings over what is happening in the region that have not been settled yet because the situation is not simple. So far, there has n not been an understanding of how to deal with all of these interests. Syria's, 
sensitive regional location, which is near Israel. Israel's presence in the region by itself is a true problem and, it, and, and a true conundrum here. The, you asked, how can we actually help the resistance on the ground? I'll tell you how. There is funding flowing from the Gulf states to some jihadist battalions, and this is something worth noting, in order to strengthen them on the ground. While there are other moderate battalions that are poor, that are not receiving support. They're civilian, they're, they're armed, but they need support. So on the ground, we have many problems, even in Turkey. Turkey supports certain sides only. There are international interests that are fighting each other in Syria, each one funding a certain side in Syria, and this is truly frightening. The youth of the armed resistance and some armed uh, civilian battalions, university students have started bearing arms. And they've named themselves the Battalions of National Unity, and they don't involve the Sunnis alone, but they involve Christians and Alawites and Druze and Ismailis, all sects. And I think that these battalions will be the nucleus of a national army, but in return, there are those who do not want for this civ civil trend to build and to grow in Syria, and they will continue to support jihadist groupings. I'll give you another example. Recently in northern Syria, in Aleppo and Idlib and Hama, the armed youth only demanded a no-fly zone. And this will be difficult, and this is not going to happen now. So they held negotiations just to get anti-aircraft weapons, because they are liberating areas on the ground. They are evicting Bashar al-Assad's army, not using heavy uh, artillery, rather using light weapons like uh, machine guns and Kalashnikovs. But their death is, is what achieves victory. They will, 20 will advance, 10 will die, and they would have advanced a step. But after all of these sacrifices, the Air Force would come and would bomb the area. Not a single country in the world allowed supplying the revolutionaries with anti-aircraft weapons so that they could protect themselves. Therefore, I see there is an international conspiracy or collusion, and there is an international silence, and something is being arranged in order to keep Syria down and keep the status quo, and to give the impression that what is happening is a Salafi and jihadist movement fighting a civil regime, which is far from the truth. Thank you. Jeffrey. Uh, my name is Jeff Laurenti with the Century Foundation. Uh, Ms. Yasbuk, uh, before the wave of intifadas began rippling out of Tunisia and Egypt, what in Syrians' day-to-day -day lives was the face of the government of the regime that they experienced? Was it the Muhabarat security forces directly impinging on them? Was it the Ba'athist party apparatus? And what did they grouse about then? And has that whole civilian infrastructure of the old regime burned away in this war? Is it now simply a militarized security apparatus run wild? And what do those in charge of that apparatus think they can achieve at the end, what they will have left to them at the end of leveling one city after another? Do they have a strategy for being able to reassert their security or a so-called secure or peaceful Syria after destroying it, creating a wilderness and calling it peace? Thank you for the question. In Syria, since Hafez al-Assad uh, took power after a, um, an armed uh, coup against his uh, Ba'athist and military buddies in 1970, at the time, he streamlined the state. He 
eliminated any state structure. We are not a state of institutions in Syria. Rather, he formed a group of uh, intelligence services that have infiltrated into every aspect of state affairs, if we are to call it a state to begin with. There was no real state in Syria. Instead, there was a group of security apparatuses that are also controlling the army. Imagine that there would be a that this, there's, there'd be a security apparatus that would overrule an army general based on their belongings and their family connections and uh, relationships with the regime, etc. So we had a group of security apparatuses that Hafez al-Assad insisted on keeping especially that for example they kept it alawite in certain areas and the and the coastline and the central area in the north uh, he brought in people called um, shawaya and he was he, he was a very clever man hafiz al-assad he was a clever dictator he was a he was a clever butcher he what he did was was he allowed the humiliated and the people who were oppressed to and the minorities to rise and uh, take advantage of their bitterness so that they would he would unleash their viciousness against Syrian citizens so he created a security a, a security state par excellence and he also created not just sectarian divisions but tribal divisions for example the air force mukhabarat or intelligence services in Syria which is currently being led by the person uh, Jamil Hassan who who actually is at the head of most massacres this is based on one tribe within the alawite sect so not only did he destroy Syrian society alone, he also destroyed the Alawite sect from the inside. What he did was he deviate its Sufi uh, uh, trends because it, as a religious sect, it's more Sufi inclined. It's closer to Buddhism. And it's, uh, it's closer to the transcendent uh, to, uh, based on the concept of tolerance and a quest to nirvana for nirvana but he destroyed this sect instead he brought this tribe and put them in one security apparatus and these apparatuses infiltrated the entire state and they were in charge they were controlling everything the uh, the media we have hospitals but we don't have good doctors the entire infrastructure was slowly destroyed over 30 years and when Bashar al-Assad came and said we will have openness and we all believed him and everybody did he did the exact opposite he brought these mega businessmen who are tied to Rami Makhlouf and uh, top uh, Damascus uh, Sunni uh, businessman from Damascus and Aleppo and he created this capitalist class that just entrenched poverty in the countryside the countryside is what paid the price and therefore the, the revolution the Syrian revolution was sparked in the countryside and the rural areas because they are being marginalized so when it destroyed the cities they don't really care about the state they destroyed what they think belongs to them it's their property they think that this country was uh, controlled by Hafez al-Assad for 30 years, and this is their backyard. So when you look and you say, how can they destroy an entire city? A short while ago, I visited Atarab, which is uh, a uh, city and in the border area. And when I when I when I went and saw it, I felt I was I was stunned. It's as if you're on a cartoon movie location about uh, abandoned and burned houses. It's been completely annihilated. This is a vengeful spirit that does this because this family and its allies have realized that those they viewed as slaves have decided that they would die rather than be humiliated. And this has been their slogan. So the regime, and this is my opinion, Bashar al-Assad will not step aside until he leaves, he leaves Syria a burning mound of rubble. Therefore, any day in the life of this regime would mean one more day of the destruction of Syria. Shukran.
Rifai from the ICRC. Samar, you have not addressed the issue of the political opposition. Who is the political opposition? And you have not addressed the image that the international community has about an opposition that is unreliable, splintered, not really representative of the revolution, and even more, not in touch with developments on the ground. So in your call to the international community for support, to the Syrians, um, could you please tell, tell the international community who they should be partnering with? Because at this point, it doesn't look clear. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tamara. And thank you for saving me with this question, because there, isn't, there wasn't much time, and I really didn't want to speak for too long. I think that. Uh, the excuse that everybody uh, is putting forward that there is no unified opposition that the entire world can uh, talk to and speak on its behalf, uh, which is why uh, we can't intervene. This is all not true because in the past there has been intervention and I'm not going to talk about Kosovo or others now, but we do have a problem, a real problem, which is in the absence of political life in Syria for over 40 years, we're talking about half a century almost. There appears to be a political vacuum that appeared now. When the uh, Syrian National Council started, it could have been a successful idea if it hadn't been for the interference of some sides and if the Syrian uh, regime had not uh, fabricated uh, a parallel opposition that uh, aimed to sabotage the real opposition. Moreover, the spirit of democracy among the desperate uh, uh, aspects of the opposition is absent. I believe that the popular revolution is stronger and more important than the political revolution that is standing in the forefront. This is something to be taken for granted. I would also like to remind you that on the ground there are some genuine revolutionary and popular opposition presences like the uh, local coordinating uh, committees as well as the young men of the revolution and battalions. I don't want to say battalions because that would uh, imply uh, weapons, but teams of political opposition that have produced leaderships and, for example, the uh, local coordination committees, I think one day will be a model for a political party that is highly organized, that has high ideals and proposals, that is civil and is very present. The uh, local coordinating committees is the, an important face of the Syrian opposition and is highly organized and is present on the inside and has uh, secret and clandestine leaderships as well as the uh, high uh, command of the Syrian revolution. So the revolution is producing popular political leaders that are present on the ground. This does not mean that the political opposition abroad should be set aside completely. There are national personalities that are genuine and that are dedicated and that are honest. And I think that if the regime falls and democratic elections are held, many men and women who are truly qualified to lead the uh, country will be present. We need to stop criticizing the Syrian revolution. Every revolution has its mistakes. But the Syrian revolution is not a revolution of individuals or forces. It is a general popular revolution. And the people need symbols. They need leaders. We need structures where we can address this revolution. But Tamara, I don't really think this is the real reason that the West must use in dealing with the revolution. It's simply an excuse. But we must be clear, because our revolution 
th this is our revolution, and we know its shortcomings, and we know the mistakes we've made, and we know what we need. Yes, it, this, this is a shortcoming, but it is a very weak excuse that the West is using. Uh, my name is uh, Khaled Mansour. I, I work for UNICEF, but this is rather a personal question. Uh, I mean, Tamara has already stolen half of it, so I will use the other half. I think the realists in the international community ask two questions. The first one, whom to talk to? And you tried to answer that, and clearly, there were not a clear address to talk to. And secondly, what will happen the day after? Those guys are concerned about the fact they needed billions of dollars and tens of thousands of soldiers to stabilize Iraq. And they look at the Iraq scenario and say, what will happen in Syria? They are worried about the day after. Maybe as a novelist or as a realist novelist, tell us, how do you think the day after will look like? The day after, of course. <laughs> I will um, go back to Tamara's question in order to respond to yours. There are political leaderships that are indeed secret, but I also believe that, and, and this, is, this is true, and I do not trust the West because they have been very disappointed by the, because the West has disappointed them from the very first day. The French and the Americans and the Brits and the Germans all say that they support the revolution, but there is a true letdown. Yes, there are leaderships that are present, but they are secret. As for what will happen, I think that the destruction in Syria is widespread, not to mention the uh, destroyed civic peace. I believe that if Bashar al-Assad does not fall, then we will be facing grave danger. The infrastructure in Syria has been destroyed at an astounding level. It's as if the regime is taking revenge on the country, on the nationhood of Syria, on the revolution we will need to rebuild. There are plans that some are putting, that are, some are drawing up now to plan for the post-regime period. But I also tell you that these, but these cannot be complete now for a simple reason. You are now under a hail of bombs. We are facing death directly. I'm a writer, and I'm supposed to be concerned with my books and my writings, but I am currently obsessed with the blood flowing in the streets, how the food will, will, will get to those who need it, what will happen to the millions of the displaced uh, in the streets, and how will we uh, get aid to the children who are dying? What about the refugee camps? Not just me. Everybody is, is preoccupied with that. So strategically, now we have preoccupations as a result of the continued massacre. Sometimes the Syrians don't have time to bury their dead. A few days ago, a child died of hunger. A child, an infant, died of hunger. Things are happening that preoccupy us and would distract us from preparing for the future and preparing a state. But there are teams that are working on this. One of them is in the United States, I think. I think one of them is in the United States. Therefore, I'm very afraid. I don't know what will happen. I think the entire Arab world will see many years of chaos, of extreme uh, damage, because these, uh, these authoritarian regimes if they do give up their thrones, they would leave behind uh, a lot of destruction, a very heavy uh, legacy of religious extremism, the absence of um, state of institutions, of uh, sectarian tensions and congestion. We will have to do a lot in order to uh, deal with the, with the chaos and destruction. I'm not saying that when Bashar leaves, everything will be all right. On the contrary, it will be facing a huge problem, but it will be the first step towards building a democratic and civil state. The departure of Bashar al-Assad is not the purpose of the revolution, but it is a requirement, it is an urgent requirement that the world must 
realize because he must be removed with any means necessary because his removal will be the key to the door of the future civil society. But for us to cross that threshold, we will go through a lot of chaos for decades. I, I don't want to say that I'm optimistic and that, uh, you know, down with the uh, with the dictatorship. No, we will have a, an ongoing battle with the side effects of this dictatorship, the byproducts of this dictatorship. Okay. Yes, um, Jose Verigat from, from IPI. Yes, uh, um, Mr. Yasbek, I wonder if you can uh, tell us a little bit about the role of other intellectuals that have played in, in the uprising in Syria, and also um, what do you think the role of an intellectual should be in this context? Thank you. Uh, unlike uh, other revolutions in the world, unlike the uh, French Revolution and others, the Arab uh, world revolutions did not have thinkers uh, or uh, academics or these uh, deep uh, ideological uh, pundits that call for deconstructing uh, the society politically and, and socially because of the deconstruction of society. There have been academics and intellectuals that have been uh, that have been distanced and marginalized, but they did not have enough of a structure to spark a revolution. This is what I see clearly. The revolution in Syria will do the opposite. We will dissolve the mechanisms of this revolution and, and think about the post-revolution stage later. I won't say there are many. Not many intellectuals uh, came out in support of the revolution, and in fact, in truth and because of fear and um, in Syria the cultural scene has been blacked out I don't think any of you know the name of a Syrian writer there has been a uh, cultural blackout but after a few months the Intellectuals have started moving, and now many of them support the revolution. But there are those who have supported it from the beginning. I'm a writer, for example. There's uh, Yasin Haj Saleh, who uh, would join us in the revolutions from the very first days. But it wasn't a strong enough movement. It has grown stronger. There are actors, uh, artists, um, painters who support the revolution. But I personally believe that this movement is weak. And this is my personal opinion. Please. I'm, uh, I'm Sergei Yakushev. I'm from the Russian permanent mission. About uh, three weeks ago, somewhere in uh, mid-August, I met uh, some refugees from Syria. They were very intelligent, educated. And uh, they told me that at the beginning, they supported the revolution with the, their heart and soul. But uh, the events, the events uh, went on, and they said that they had to, to flee the country. And from what, from what they told me, from their point of view, uh, the revolution is Syri in Syria is over. Because, yes, Becky, you, you, you used that word uh, very many times. And uh, from your point of view, uh, maybe that's right. But from what I heard from them, the revolution is over, and it was a failure. And now there is a, a war, which is quite different from the revolution, quite different from what happened in, uh, in Egypt and Cairo. It, it looks much more the, like events in, uh, in Libya and uh, from just yesterday's news, we know what, what, what's, what's, what can be the result of it. So uh, from, still from your point of view, is the revolution going on because they, they are very much disappointed and they told me that uh, the, the majority of the population which supported the, the, the hope for the new regime, now they, they, they are um, kind of disappointed 
and uh, the only, the only uh, feeling they have is to survive in the war. So the question is, is the revolution uh, still exists? I, is it going on? Or is it really a dying and it's, it's just a, a word in Syria? Shukran. I thank you for uh, this uh, question. You've uh, posed several questions and I will uh, respond. Can you hear me? You, you've asked several questions and, and I will uh, respond to each question separately. The revolution in Syria is not like the one in uh, Egypt and Tunisia. This is something that no two people will uh, disagree on because Hosni Barak and Zayd al Abidin bin Ali did not uh, use airplanes to bomb the cities and did not kill their people this way. They uh, stepped aside in a lenient way. I say lenient, even though it wasn't, but it is compared to what's happening in Syria. So yes, you are right, the revolution in Syria is not like the revolution in Egypt and the one in Tunisia, not even in Libya, because in Libya unfolded in a different manner. Secondly, the revolution in Syria at the beginning was something and it changed and became something else. But I insist that it is a revolution and not a war. And I'll tell you why. After the, after 18 or 19 months almost of daily violence, daily systematic violence. I'm sorry, but I, w I want to speak to you personally. Suppose you, God forbid, uh, you have a family uh, who's who was killed in its entirety, and you said, fine, I will let the law take precedence. But then this person who killed your family then killed somebody else, and another person, another person, and you finally find, you, and you find yourself alone without any family. Will you always be an angel? Will you not cry? Will you not feel angry? Will you not do anything? So what happened in Syria? What happened in Syria? happened after violent reactions. Why? Because we were unable to control an entire people. You have an entire people being exterminated. There were some violent incidents, but the revolution also condemned these uh, violent incidents. I'll, I'll give you an example. A member of the Free Syrian Army said to me that one of his battalions killed an Alawite. He killed him just because he was an Alawite. And he was punished and imprisoned, and he admitted, and he repented. So there are mistakes that are being committed. All revolutions have mistakes. This happens all over the place. And I, I am not justifying violence, but you are asking the victim who is being killed. They're not just killing people, but after they're buried, then they bomb their graves. You know this happens in Syria. You're asking the victim to be killed, to remain silent, and to never speak against anything. 18 months of killing and massacres have been taking place. People want to defend themselves. I have went to hotspots, and I'm not allowed to be in the country, but I, I, I went, I snuck into the country, and I went in with the Free Syrian Army. There were all Sunnis, and I was the only Alawite there. And one of them, and one of them had a sister who was raped, but I was among them, and they were protecting me as if I was their own sister. They are not sectarian; they want to live in peace. However, when sectarian tensions are being built and increased, and there, there will be more reactions. I'm not saying that there are no mistakes in the revolution, but in the revolution, when mistakes do happen. They are announced. They are discussed. For example, in the city of Al Bab, the Shabbiha were violently shot by some anti regime elements, and those people who shot them were held accountable. Mistakes do happen because of the violence, but those that you've met in the camp, and these are extremely uh, smart and cultured, and I don't doubt that. Maybe they want a sanitized revolution, a revolution that is free of everything, a revolution that's very nicely presented on a plate to them. And I think that 
the Syrian people and I wish for this, but we don't really, we can't ask people who are being killed and massacred not to have a reaction. These reactions are under control. They are discussed. All the mistakes of the, revolu of the revolution are discussed and examined. The revolution is going through a different stage than it was going through in the past. Yes, there are mistakes. Every society has the good and the bad. And yes, there are a lot of bad guys that have uh, taken up arms un under the banner of the Free Syrian Army, but they're actually looting and robbing because of this. And I've witnessed some of these incidents. And some kidnappings were committed for ransom, just for money, for cash because there is poverty. The primary responsibility does not lie on the revolution. Therefore, there, it's a revolution with problems, yes, but it is a revolution and it will continue. The Syrians will not go back, even if the entire world abandons them, even if they are transferred into simply a religious identity, they will not we, they will not retreat. The young men I've talked to, they said, we are dead. We are the walking dead. I told them, why do you walk towards death? And they said that we are already walking the walking dead. In other words, Sahar is saying there is no uh, revolution that is purified, sterilized mm -hmm. from all this. Uh, they will bound to be mistakes here and there, but the most important thing is they recognize their mistake and rectify them. And I think this is, this is the idea. Um, the floor is still open, of course. Please. Thank you very much. My name is Bakr Al-Hayari. I'm from Religions for Peace. Uh, I will ask the question in Arabic to make it easier for you. I thank you for uh, your um, simplified and uh, analysis, but it was very useful and very accurate of the situation in Syria and the, and the revolution in Syria and the way that it is progressing. We understand that the Alawites are in an existential situation and they have interests uh, with the uh, regime and the relationship is complicated. Most Alawites uh, have an understandable position if you take it outside the context of uh, what is happening now. But there are other minorities, especially the, uh, I don't want to use the, the term minorities and I support you in, in, in your distaste for the expression, but there are the Christians, for example. How do you explain their position, which can be described in the least as, uh, as um, upsetting? And what about the insistence of uh, Christian leaders in Syria to support the regime to the very last breath? And this, as somebody from the region, is completely um, baffling. Could you uh, shed some, some light on that? Uh, Do you know uh, Basel Shahada? He's a director who was killed. He's, he's a Christian. He was a Christian. You want to say that the majority, interpreter can't hear the speaker. A lot of the individual, many persons, individuals, families, and large parts of the uh, Christian community. The, the, we, we know what's in their hearts, but the main problem lies with, the, with their leaderships, with their leaders. What do you mean by leaders? I, I mean the church. What about Ahmed Hassoun, says Yazbek? Ahmed Hassoun, is he Sunni or Christian? He's a leader. What about the Mufti Al-Buti? You must know that there are many priests and monks in Homs that support the revolution and give help, but in secret. I, I confirm that they do this secretly. Why? I want to speak about the Syrian demographic map. 
just to, to uh, show a point, if we want to say that there is a Sunni majority that is revolting, that there's something here that's, that's amusing. The number of Sunnis supporting the regime outnumber the Alawites supporting the regime. Why? Because the Alawites form 12% of the population of Syria. Therefore, they are a minority. The Christians form an even lesser percentage. Sunni Muslims are the um, largest uh, sect, and they are the largest sect that is taking part in the revolution. This is the first mistake that is made. As for the Christians, I personally, in the, in the demonstrations that I participated in, many of the young men and the women uh, participating were Christians. And in the areas of sectarian tensions, when cities were besieged, it was the Christians who delivered the food and medicine. They were terrorized. They were intimidated. For example, in Qasta and Damascus, they fired or they shelled a church because of the revolutionaries. But this is not true because at the time, five Christian young men were killed. The regime killed. And this was in the Abbasid uh, Square. They killed five Christian young men because they were supporting the revolution. And this is all documented. As for this whole talk about the leaders, let's talk about Sunni leaders. The top merchants of Damascus support the regime. It's not about sectarianism. It's about interests. al Bouti still supports the regime. He's a Sunni and he's a Kurd. It's not sectarian. It's not religious. There is an insinuation, and there's, there's, they're giving the hints of sectarianism, but the regime did not succeed. If the regime had succeeded in raising sectarian tensions, you would be seeing a war in Syria. There is no uh, sectarian war in Syria. That is not true. There is a revolution in Syria. There are violent reactions. I don't know if there's if there's somebody who's who's an artist skilled in criminality and in the fabrication of hatred like Bashar al-Assad. I have not seen anyone as skilled as Bashar al-Assad. Therefore, I can't talk about leaderships or leaders. There are priests, there are monks. I know a lot of them, clergymen who support the revolution. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Leonie Yassen, and I work in the UN's... Uh, Speak to the microphone and raise your voice, please. Okay. Um, my name is Leonie Yassen, and I work in the UN's Department of Political Affairs. Thank you very much for your very uh, interesting... Sorry. Sorry. And personal account. Uh, my question is very much along the line of the headlines of today's event, uh, namely uh, a woman in the crossfire. And it seems that until now that the Syrian women are missing from all the peace efforts that are going on. And we know, you know, very well uh, the importance of the buy-in and legitimacy of any any. Um, uh, agreement that's reached that we need to have the other half of the population in there. For now, it seems that we are seeing the Syrian women as the victims of sexual violence and, and the bloodshed. But I'd be very interested in hearing uh, your view on their possible role in establishing a ceasefire or a wider peace agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, will end. I will start with uh, answering the last question. Women saying that women are victims of sexual violence in states of war and situations of violence when there uh, when there are weapons, women and children are usually the first targets. Yes, uh, women have suffered from sexual violence and the revolution. But to say that women are absent, and I disagree with you, we have the most important uh, factions in the revolution are being led by women. We talk about the Alawites, the most important figures, Alawite figures in the revolution were women. I'm sure you've heard of Razan Zaytouni. She is a young woman. She's a revolutionary leader. We have many names. Women, unlike appearances, 
are present. There is a problem. In the, in the very in the early months, everybody was out on the streets. But when the violence increased, women's presence became limited, and women were absent in the street. But practically, they are leading and organizing. And I know women who were driving uh, large trucks to deliver aid, and they were being shot at. I know women who are shooting films in order to deliver them to the media because the media are forbidden from accessing the country. I know women who are organizing and institutionalizing political structures. When I left Syria a while ago, I established in Paris an organization for Syrian women to give aid to them. We have many activists, female activists on the inside that are caring for the revolution. I think the media or their presence in the media the, the, these fem these women's presence in the media right now is something that cannot be considered for personal safety. If I had not left Syria, I can't, I can't be sitting here and speaking to you because we are being threatened with murder on a daily basis. But women are very present, especially amongst the, uh, including the extremist, uh, inside extremist uh, Islamic circles, but in a different way. I have my own personal fears after what happened in Egypt uh, recently, the law that allowed uh, uh, girls to marry at the age of 13. This has scared me, but these same fears make me and other women more adamant to remain present so that the change would be civil and it would be closer to us and our lives. We must not abandon it because of a political condition that led to uh, a rise of an Islamic trend after years and years of dictatorships and authoritarian regimes. In order for us to confront this danger, we must remain present within the mechanism of this change. But yes, I do have my fears, but we have plans, and we have a way of thought, and we are thinking of what will happen and how things will be. If there is, there is only room for one question. If not, oh. <laughs> if not, uh, You all agree with me. No. Ah. Okay. Thank you again. I'm sorry for. Um, I just want to. Uh, I just want to reaffirm what you've said about the international committee, and that the international community is looking uh, for leaders. I don't disagree. I mean, the, the, the Syrian regime is, is, not, is no different from other regimes. They have not left any social or political or popular leaderships that can be present. Leaders that can, leaderships for the opposition. The international community, if it really wants to find a solution, it will find a solution. It's never a problem. يعني انترم ليدرشيبس وان يو وانت فالمشكله هي عدم سو ذا بروبلم از ذات ذير از نو جينيوين ديزاير تو سولف ذا بروبلم ثانك يو ثانك يو فيري ماتش اي ثينك ذاتس ا كويشن سينس سينس شي از ا وومن اند وي هاف تو بروموت ذا رول اوف وومن سو اي ويل جيف هير از ان اكسبشن ذا فلور يو هاف ذا فلور از ذا لاست Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the time. Um, my name is Leila Nikchu from Parliamentarians for Global Action. And I wanted to ask Samar, do you think a referral of the situation by the Security Council to the International Criminal Court would be helpful? Of course. Of course, it will be useful. It will be a very important step. And we have uh, hundreds of files documenting what has happened. Uh, in the organization that uh, we work in, have, we have uh, documented cases of uh, rape and of uh, collective uh, crimes committed against women, which uh, would be enough uh, to uh, refer the entire Assad family to the ICC. We do need this, definitely. I think you all agree with me. This has been one of the best uh, discourse in the Arab uprising. 
Summer, after all, is someone who is not a neutral observer. Summer who was imprisoned, was harassed. She participated in the uprising, and she was very brave. I asked her before we started, how did she manage to, to, to leave Syria when, when we, they were looking after her? But thanks God, miraculously, she succeeded in leaving Damascus. But uh, I think you all agree this discussion has been very fruitful, and we have learned a lot from uh, Summer. And thank you very, very much.